Like many dungeon masters, I've implemented many house rules over my years of running D&D games, and I'm sure you have too. Naturally, many of these house rules we create are intended to overcome flaws in the system and improve gameplay. Of course, some of the house rules turn out to be great and others completely flop. That's that's just the nature of the beast. Now, since I started playing Pathfinder 2nd Edition about a year ago, I've seen that PF2 overcomes many of the flaws inherent in D&D 5th Edition and is overall a better game system. However, I realize that not everyone wants to switch game systems. So today I'm going to give you 10 house rules that you can steal from Pathfinder 2 to make your D&D games better. Disclaimer here, these house rules change game mechanics and some of them are core mechanics that underpin large parts of the game. Whenever you're messing around with these, there are likely to be unintended consequences. Thus, my recommendation when implementing any house rule is to consider it carefully before implementing and then keep an eye on things. Evaluate whether it's working or not. Maybe you can make some tweaks to improve it, but maybe it's just not meant to be and you need to get rid of it entirely. Also, evaluate if your group is having fun with the house rule. After all, isn't that why we're playing the game to begin with? Number one, attack rolls that hit by 10 or more are critical hits. I'm currently running both Pathfinder 2nd Edition and D&D 5e games. And whenever someone in my D&D group rolls really high to hit something, I find myself thinking, you know, if this were Pathfinder 2, that would be a crit. So why not make it a crit too? This is something that I love about Pathfinder 2nd Edition because it does a few awesome things to improve gameplay. First, it makes the characters feel more heroic against lower level baddies because they are critting more and that is an awesome feeling. Next, when the characters square off against a high level boss that has a higher to hit bonus, that boss will crit more against them. This amps up the drama and threat of that enemy, making combat way more exciting. Third, it speeds up combat. How many times have you been in a fight in D&D 5th edition where the outcome was certain because one side was clearly way more powerful? Well, using this house rule will deplete the hit points of the losing side faster, hurrying along the inevitable conclusion. This is especially true when there's a large disparity between the character's level and the challenge rating of the monsters. Now, as a special consideration for 5th edition's bounded accuracy game mechanic, which Pathfinder 2 does not use, you may consider having attack rolls that hit by five or more be critical hits. That would make things a lot more dangerous for both sides and could be tons of fun to try out just to see how it goes. Number two, alternate methods of initiative. Why does dexterity always win in initiative? A perceptive character should be able to use wisdom. A character who had time to plan their attack on an ambush should be able to use intelligence. A fighter who bull rushes the enemy should be able to use strength. I mean, why not? So this is what you do. When your players roll initiative, they may, at their option, request to use a different ability score modifier to roll initiative with, as long as they can justify it narratively. And here's the thing, it must key off something they were doing just before the combat broke out. It must fit the story, the narrative. Otherwise, you're gonna find every player will always come up with something so that they can just use their best ability score modifier. That's why it must fit in with something their character was doing before fists started flying. Also, for those of you who play Pathfinder 2, you may be saying, but wait, Pathfinder 2 uses skill modifiers, such as athletics, deception, stealth, and the like, not ability score modifiers. And you're right, of course. However, for this D&D 5e house rule, we don't want to do that for two reasons. First, because of the bounded accuracy game mechanic differential. And second, because monsters in D&D 5e don't have special initiative modifiers. They just use their dexterity modifiers and usually have crappy ones at that. So the best a monster could hope for is a plus four or a plus five bonus. And if characters are routinely getting twice or three times that because they're using their skill modifiers instead of their ability score modifiers, it is going to lead to a lopsided house rule. This of course leads us to the next point. 
let monsters do the same thing. If it's justified narratively, let them use different ability scores for initiative as well. By the way, if you'd like to get over 600 pages of fifth edition game master resources for your games, you need to check out our Layers and Legends 2 Kickstarter at the link below. Get yourself two big, fat, beefy books stuffed full of over 30 adventures spanning levels 1 to 20, 30 standalone encounters, more than 100 monsters across the entire challenge rating range, six new rule sets, puzzles, traps, and more. Our Layers and Legends 1 books were so popular and sold out so fast that we're now bringing you the second installment. Oh, and check out these limited edition alt covers. These bad boys right here will have only one print run as part of this Kickstarter. You can learn more and back Layers and Legends 2 at the link below. Number three, limitations on spell and ability use to avoid spamming. Oh my gosh, I cannot tell you how sick I am of clerics in D&D 5th edition spamming guidance for entire game sessions. Like, yes, I get that it's a good cantrip in a system with bounded accuracy, and to not do it is to give up a big advantage. So, does it make sense for clerics to spam it? I guess. Jeez, does it get old. Now in Pathfinder 2, certain spells and abilities have usage limits. For example, with Guidance, once it has been cast on a creature, that creature is immune to the Guidance spell for the next hour. I love that. It's a common sense limitation that stops all the spamming. Now be careful, I would not do this to everything. Instead, be very selective about the ability or spells that you apply this to. Remember, you are effectively nerfing something a player has, so they probably won't like it very much. Therefore, make sure that you have a very good reason for doing so. This is not something to take lightly or toss around irresponsibly. However, when there are legitimate game balance issues, which D&D 5th edition has lots of, or there are other issues being caused, this can certainly help. Number four, natural healing and treat wounds rules. Here's a way to make short rests a lot more interesting and make the healing less of a guarantee. You can require skill checks for healing during short rests, akin to Pathfinder 2's treat wounds. For example, if a player with a proficiency in medicine makes a medicine check at DC 10 plus half the party's level rounded down, the treated character heals two of their hit dice worth of healing. Also, put a limit on how many times the skill can be used during a short rest, perhaps just six times, which means they are able to treat wounds once every 10 minutes. And if you want to make long rests less of a hand wave of, you get all your hit points back, you can use Pathfinder 2's resting rules. Basically, characters heal their constitution modifier at minimum of one times their level in hit points during a long rest. Oh, and there's a feat in Pathfinder 2 called Combat Medicine we can steal as well. This is a feat your D&D characters can pick up, and if they have it, they can use a medicine check during combat once per character to treat wounds similar to how they would do during a short rest that we just got done talking about. Big disclaimer. At this point, we're starting to goof around with some fairly strong underlying game mechanics in D&D 5th edition. So there's going to be unexpected and perhaps undesired consequences. So this is a house rule that you want to keep a careful eye on as you play test your game. I mean, you play test all house rules to see if you like them or hate them, of course, but this one could be particularly noodle. By the way, if you're finding this information useful, please give me a thumbs up and share this video with a fellow game master. And if you think that I don't completely suck, please leave me a comment down below. I mean, say anything really. Perhaps tell me that I'm not really going bald and that you can barely see that massive pimple on my nose right there. So baldness here, pimple here. Well, yeah, I got problems. <laughs> These are YouTuber problems, like going bald and I have a pimple. For most people, that's not that big of a deal, right? Right? Number five, flanking. Yes, I know the flanking alternate rule already exists in D&D 5e, but I hate it. I mean, granting advantage is just way too powerful. And frankly, the advantage mechanic in general is something that I don't like about D&D 5th edition. Yes, it makes gameplay easier and faster than having to add and subtract modifiers to rules but it has some big flaws. It's swingy at the extremes and unbalances crit fishing characters such as rogues and paladins. Overall, it's a sloppy game mechanic in my opinion, but 
we're gonna save that rant for a future video. Instead, just grant a negative two armor class penalty to an enemy who is flanked. This is what Pathfinder 2 does with their flat-footed or their off-guard condition. That's a much more reasonable adjustment than granting advantage on attack rolls. Number six, are you sick? Why not just try throwing up? I mean, that's what I do when I'm sick. I just go barf my brains out in the bathroom and then I feel better. Okay, <laughs> this one is gross, but in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, I love the fact that characters can voluntarily use an action to make a fortitude save to vomit and reduce the sickened condition. You could apply this to the D&D poisoned condition as well. If a character uses its action to throw up or take another action to overcome its poisoning, they get to make another constitution save to get rid of the poisoned condition. I mean, but why stop there? You can probably do something similar for other conditions. I'm not gonna go through the entire list, but for some conditions, it might be reasonable for characters to use an action, not a bonus action or free action, mind you, but an action, a full action, to attempt to remove a condition that is ailing them. Stunning Fist, I am looking at you. Perhaps I use my action to clear my head, and if I make my con save, I can at least move away from that horrible monk who is just gonna chase after me and do it again to me. That sucks. I hate the stun mechanic in D&D 5th edition. It is so bad. This is another one of the things that Pathfinder 2 made better. Stunned in Pathfinder 2 doesn't just screw you over for the entire round. Like, there are levels to stun. If you're stunned one, you lose one of your three actions. Stunned two, you lose two of your three actions. And stunned three, you lose three of your three actions, and so on and so forth. And at the end of each of your turns, you get your level of stun goes down by one, so you get your actions back. It's actually a beautiful mechanic when you see it in practice. And it doesn't just take people out of gameplay and make them sit on the sidelines and watch while everybody else has fun. <sighs> okay, there was an unexpected rant for you, but there you go. Number seven, change cantrip damage scaling. Look, again, I, I know this already exists in D&D Petition, but the damage power-ups don't occur that often. And if you're a player, it can take ages, it seems, before your firebolt gains damage. Thus, I think that going the route of having cantrips do less damage initially, but scale up more often could be fun. Consider this. Instead of Firebolt doing 1d10 damage at level one and then 2d10 at level five, wouldn't it be more fun if it did 1d6 damage at first level, 2d6 at third level, 3d6 at fifth level, 4d6 at seventh level, and so on? I mean, I think so. Now, the trick here, of course, is to implement the change such that you're not actually changing the damage the cantrip deals that much. This is a house rule for psychological benefit, to make things more fun. We're not actually trying to boost damage or decrease it for that matter. Now, our quick and dirty method for scaling cantrips is to do this. First, cantrip damage dice are reduced by two steps. So a D10 becomes a D6, a D8 becomes a D4, and so on to a minimum of D4. Then the damage increases by that amount every other level. So your damage increases come at levels three, five, seven, and so on. At those levels, you gain an additional die. Number eight, the step action. Goodbye, disengage, hello, step. Look, using an entire action to disengage is just brutal. This means essentially that you disengage, move away on your turn, only to have the enemy on their turn move after you and attack anyway. Like, like what did you actually gain? This, by the way, is why retreating from combat in 5th edition D&D is practically impossible. It's usually a death sentence, so you might as well just stand your ground and fight to the death. Instead, let's make disengaging a bonus action. S sorry, Rose. Sorry. So that retreating is an actual option in the game. And if that seems too powerful, give players this option. Either disengage as an action to not provoke attacks at all, or disengage as a bonus action to confer disadvantage on opportunity attacks. Then your players have options, and the more action economy they use, the better the results. Of course, another option is to make it so that not everyone gets opportunity attacks, but we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Number nine, the three action economy. This is perhaps one of my favorite parts of Pathfinder 2, the three action economy. Look, this is what happens on the average player's turn in D&D 5th edition. They take an action of some sort, attack or cast a spell and whatnot, you resolve it, 
And then there's this long pause. As the dungeon master, you may assume they are done, so you move on to the next player. However, the first player is like, no way, l let me see if there's a bonus action I can use. So you wait, and then they're like, nope, nope, nothing, never mind. So you go on to the next player, and the first one is like, wait, 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 I, I think I might actually want to move too. So then they move. This results in this sort of back and forth issue of, I'm done with my turn, but I'm not actually done with my turn. Or what you do as a game master is simply begin to prompt every player every single time, are you done? Do you want to move? Do you have any bonus actions you want to take? I'm telling you on paper, action, movement, bonus action is fine. But in practice, it is a sloppy way to play the game. Now, you may be saying, but Luke, that's just your players. Get better players. <laughs> and, and that's fair. Some players are like that. However, I have had the advantage of playing with the same group for years in D&D 5th edition, and then moving with the same group over to Pathfinder 2nd edition. And let me tell you from firsthand experience that it works. Using the three action economy of Pathfinder 2 speeds up our turns and lets me, the Game Master, know exactly when a player is done or if they aren't. There's no back and forth. There's no, oh wait, I can also. There's none of that stuff going on. As soon as they have three actions completed, I know they're done. We go on to the next player and they can't tell me they're not done. <laughs> so for your D&D 5th edition games, get rid of the action movement bonus action system. Just make it three actions per turn. Period. You can move three times if you want. You can attack three times if you want. You can move once, attack twice, move twice, attack once. You get the idea. Now, this is a change to a core mechanic. So unintended consequences will be many, I'm sure. The first one right off the bat is that allowing more attacks is going to increase damage output. However, it also increases the DPS of the monsters. So you could argue that it's even Steven. So test it out. And if it seems off, you can institute a multiple attack penalty system called MAP for short, whereby the subsequent attacks have a penalty. Now in Pathfinder 2, the second attack you make on your turn has a negative five penalty. And the third attack on your turn has a negative 10 penalty. But in fifth edition with its bounded accuracy mechanic, you may want to use a negative three and negative six respectively. However, test first without any map at all and see how things work out for you. Or you could do something cool like this. The first attack on your turn has advantage. The second attack on your turn is a straight roll. And the third attack on your turn has disadvantage. Remembering, of course, that the same thing applies to monsters. That might make things pretty darn spicy. Next, how does this change affect spell casting? To make this quick and dirty, I'd say that every bonus action spell now requires one action and that every action spell now requires two actions. That should mostly balance things out. And remember, this applies to monsters too. There will probably be other things that need tweaking, but just play it by ear and see how it goes and make changes as needed. Number 10, levels of frightened, stunned, etc. One of the things I love about Pathfinder 2nd Edition is how you assign values to many of the conditions. For instance, as I mentioned before, you have stunned one, stunned two, and stunned three. And each level of stun takes away one of your actions. So if you're just stunned one, you still have two actions on your turn. And then at the end of your turn, your stun value decreases by one. This makes it so that unless a character or monster critically fails their saving throw, they're not just removed from combat entirely. Now, implementing this sort of thing with the different conditions that it makes sense for would take quite a bit of rework to 5e's core rules, frankly, and I don't have any quick rules of thumb for you, but man, wouldn't that be nice? Honorable mention. More cool reactions, fewer attacks of opportunity. Now, I love the poison and disease rules in Pathfinder 2. They actually make sense. They have a set duration and you can save to overcome them. But if you fail, they get more severe. Or at least make it so that you must save more than once to recover if you've failed multiple times. However, my honorable mention goes to reducing the number of attacks of opportunity and instead giving characters and monsters different cool things they can do with their reactions. In Pathfinder 2, I love the fact that only 5 to 20% of characters and monsters have attacks of opportunity. And there are so many cool reactions that both monsters and characters get instead 
that make combat more interesting and dynamic. Some creatures have an ambush reaction when a creature moves within 20 feet of their place of hiding. Others can disperse burning cinders into the air when they are struck, and yet others can use a bit of movement as a reaction. Now, as much as I wish the next edition of D&D coming out would use some of these Pathfinder 2 conventions, because you know, half of the D&D design team now used to work at Paizo. I'm pretty sure that's probably not gonna happen, but you know, one can hope. Anyway, that's just what I think. Let us know down in the comments what house rules you use in your D&D 5e game. And don't forget to check out our Layers and Legends 2 Kickstarter at the link below. Get over 600 pages of 5e Game Master resources to fuel your games for years to come. Now, creating a D&D adventure isn't always easy. And if you want to learn about what not to do, check out this video right here. And until next time, happy game mastering.